Okay, well, he put the slides. Uh, today I will be speaking on the sealed people of God. Okay, the sealed people of God. Because last week I left everyone with a cliffhanger. Correct or not? Last week I talked about uh, the six seals of Revelation chapter 6. Okay, the six seals. What is seal number one? You all tell me. What's seal number one? What animal is it? White horse. White horse. What, what, uh, what's the church? A fostering church. Okay. Second seal? Black horse. <laughs> red horse. Okay. Second seal is the red horse. Uh, what church is that? Persecuted church. Yeah. Who persecuted them? Romans. Okay. Good. Third seal? Black horse. Black horse. Who? What is that? Apostasized church. Fourth seal? Pale <coughs> horse. What? What is that? The great apostasy, the dark ages. Okay, the dark ages. What is the fifth seal? No horse. No horse. Okay, yes, no horse. Uh, the fifth seal is the era of the martyrs, the era of the reformation. Okay. Uh, how it started? John Wycliffe translated the Bible to English, but that's not the official date. The official date of the era of Reformation is 1517, when Martin Luther nailed it. Okay. So the fifth seal actually opened a bit before that. Okay. Uh, sixth seal was three signs. What are the signs? Number one, earthquake. Second one, sun is black and moon is red. Third one, star falling. Are we still waiting for it to happen? Why are we waiting? Not interested. Already. 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 Happened already. No need to wait anymore. It already finished the wait. Okay. So after that, it's supposed to be what? Okay. It's supposed to be sensitive. But the way the Bible described the chapter 6 are also in the book of Matthew and Mark. After the stars fall down from heaven, the next thing that happened is what? No, no, no. In Mark and Matthew. Jesus Christ mentioned uh, that in the last days uh, the stars will fall down from heaven. And after that, is what? It's the, sec it's the coming of the Son of Man. It's the second coming of Jesus Christ. So by right, by right, uh, Jesus Christ should be back. But he is not back. Now uh, we are in 2019 and, and he's still not back. Okay. So why is he not back? <coughs> we also discussed last week, the first four verses of Revelation chapter 7. He is waiting for the 144,000 people to be sealed by God. Am I not? He's waiting for 144,000 to be sealed by God. Today we will understand how what is the sealing about, what is the seal of God, how to be sealed, and all about it. Okay? So the title uh, will be the sealed people of God. Okay, uh, let's start with the word of prayer. Okay. Father in heaven, I ask that you bless each and every one of us today because we have come to hear this sermon. Whether we are physically here in this Kulim church, or whether we are listening to it via the internet as the sermon is recorded. We ask God that you bless each and every one of us for having the intention to simply listen to what you are saying today. And God, we are sure that because we have taken this small initiative of listening, we will certainly be blessed. Some problem in a specific area of life that we are tackling will go away because we have shown faithfulness to you and we thank you for it, God. And now at this moment, God, I ask that you bless the audience with a full portion of your Holy Spirit that they may be able to discern what you are saying through me, a broken vessel of yours. Secondly, God, I ask that you also bless me, anoint my lips and protect all listeners from the sins that we spew out from my life into this message. Let your message remain pure and uncontaminated. We ask for a full portion of your Holy Spirit. We ask for powerful angels to form hatchet around all of us so that we may listen in peace and not be distracted by the forces of evil that definitely don't want us to hear this message. Thank you so much, God, for listening and answering our prayer. For we in faith pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. All right, we change to, uh, we turn the book to Revelation chapter 7, okay? 
Revelation chapter 7. Now, we are going on verse 3. Revelation chapter 7, verse 3. Saying, heard not the earth. This is the angel that is ascending from the east. Okay, the angel that stops the four winds from being loose. Four winds is the big trouble that was coming. We discussed last week. Heard not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Okay? So, question number one. What is a seal? What is a seal? A seal can mean three things. Number one, it can mean the animal, a seal. The very cute animal you throw the fish. Okay? But that, obviously that is not the seal. They are not going to give you a seal on your forehead. Okay? Number two, the seal is like the seals in Revelation chapter 6. It is like a glue, a sticker that, that prevents two letters from opening. It is not that seal also. So number three is the third meaning of the seal. This is the seal. The seal is a, a chop. You know, a chop. So you have a letter, and somewhere in the letter there will be a chop. This is uh, a stamp, a stamp, a chop, a mark. Okay? Uh, nowadays we don't use a seal anymore, we use a chop. The, the, Ah, uh, stamp, it's called a stamp. We use a stamp, or sometimes we just use the signature, okay? This seal has a function. The function of the seal is to give proof of identity or ownership. So when people look at the seal, they know who is in charge of this, who said this, you see? It marks that the document is also authentic. So the seal actually uh, came from the olden days. You know, in the olden days, the, the king's people, uh, the tax collectors especially, they will go through the village and say, Oh, the king has made a decree. Attention. Your tax is raised to 50% now. Then, oh, the, the villagers will come out and say, Where is the decree? Then, then they will show a big scroll. You think the villagers can read all the words that's written there? They are looking for something. They are looking for the seal. They want to know whether really the king said it, does it have the king's seal or not? And when it has the king's seal, Oh, they don't play a fool with it. Because if you play a fool with the king's seal, you can get beheaded. You see, it is the, it's the authority. Oh, the king said it. We must hear it. So that is the seal. They are waiting for God's people to have the seal. So today I'm going to talk to you about three things about this seal. Okay? So what is the seal? What, what, what is the seal? What is the seal of God? So just now I gave the example of law. Can I not? When we talk about law, what law do we remember in the Bible that is being repeated from beginning to ending? What law is that? Ah, the Ten Commandments. You see, the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments are laws. Must we follow or not? Yes. Do they must follow or not? Yes. But Jesus Christ died on the cross today, so now no need to follow, eh? Yes, we definitely, we have to follow. A simple answer is that the law is the character of God. Our God, eh? It's the same yesterday, it's the same today, and you can be assured it's the same tomorrow also. He is the same from beginning to ending. The law is the character of God. God's character did not change. God's character is the same. If you are a tidy person, just now we learned the Ark of the Government was with God. Correct. Yes. How can it be changed? Yes, yes, of course. Correct. God would definitely not change the yeah. But uh, for the for the simple person, for the lay person, if you're watching through the internet, if you are a tidy person, no matter what happens, you are still a tidy person. So your house rules will naturally be no mess allowed. Hundred years later, if you're still alive, you're still a tidy person unless you have changed. Now God does not change, so the rules would still be the same. No mess allowed. So in the beginning, God gave Ten Commandments. Until the end of eternity, the Ten Commandments will still stand because they are the character of God. God has this personality. You may like it, you may not like it because we all have different personalities. But if you want to live with God under His house, then you have to follow His rules. Now, where is God's seal in this law? How, how do we look at the Ten Commandments and say that that is from God? How, how do we know? How do we know that the Ten Commandments is from God? Where is the seal? So, we know the Ten Commandments are found in the Bible. So where is the seal? Is it here? The word KJV? 
Okay, JV is the seal. Then, some, some people use the NIV, so the NIV is the seal. Or is it the cross? You know, some Christians, they wear the cross. So the cross is the, ah, this is the seal of God. You see? The seal of God uh, is found in the Ten Commandments, particularly on the Fourth Commandment. Particularly on the Fourth Commandment. Let's turn to the Fourth Commandment. It is in Exodus chapter 20. Yes. <coughs> Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is the fourth commandment that we memorize. But this is not the full fourth commandment. You see, if you analyze the all ten commandments, uh, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, you will realize that anybody could have said it. I can say, don't murder somebody, don't commit adultery. I can say that I am God. So don't create another image of me. This is me. We don't create another image. Anybody can say it. How do we know that it is God that said Ten Commandments? Maybe somebody else already uh, bluffed and wrote, wrote something else inside the day. How can we know that this is from God? Where is the chop? The seal or the stamp is found in the fourth commandment, the full commandment, you see. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. Okay, verse 9. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So the seven day Sabbath, uh, seven day Sabbath. Okay, we can count seven, correct? Not? Let's count together. Sunday is the first day, correct? So it's Sunday one, Monday two, Tuesday three, Wednesday four, Friday five, Saturday six, Sunday seven. Huh? Huh? That is how people count and end up with the seven day of the Sunday, you see? But you count properly. Sunday 1, Monday 2, Tuesday 3, Wednesday 4, Thursday 5, Friday 6, and Saturday 7. Do you know many people think that the seventh day is also the first day which is Sunday? And they celebrate the Sabbath on the Sunday? And they say it is the seventh day Sabbath that we are celebrating today on Sunday, the first day of the week also. So, if you count properly using a calculator, I'm sure you will understand that Sabbath is on the seventh day and it's a Saturday, which is the seventh day, okay? Some people are not good at maths, use a calculator. You will arrive that it's Saturday, it's the seventh day, okay? Now, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. So this is the Lord's day. The moment you acknowledge the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, uh, you acknowledge that that is the God's the, the Lord thy God. This Lord uh, is the capital L-O-R-D, you know, in your KJV English Bible. This is the name of God really. In it thou shalt not do other, uh, any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Okay, focus verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is, all in them is, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day, the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. So when you worship God, when you keep the seventh day Sabbath, you are acknowledging that the Lord, L-O-R-D, that is his name, huh? the Lord is, you are acknowledging number one, that the Lord is your God, that L-O-R-D, his name is your God, and secondly, you are also saying that he created the heavens and the earth and all that is in the heavens and the earth. So it doesn't matter whether, oh, you think I am God, or he is God, or she is God. It doesn't matter. The moment you keep the Sabbath day, the seventh day Sabbath, you are saying that whoever created the earth and the heavens that I can see, whoever created all this creation that I see with my eyes, huh, I am worshipping that God. So if I come and say, I am that God, oh, okay, I'm worshipping you, but how I do it? By keeping the Sabbath day. And, and can you worship me by keeping the Sabbath day? Cannot, because it will be meaningless to me. I, I didn't create it. So whatever you do is still not me. You see? You, nobody can copy this anymore, because there is only one creator. Only one person created the whole of creation. The Sabbath day, uh, 
is his seal. That is his mark of authority. This is mine. The devil can come up uh, with the other nine commandments. Many other religions uh, have the nine commandments. You know, in Hinduism and Buddhism and all the other religions, they teach many good things. They teach you not to steal, not to commit adultery and all these things. They have all these rules and regulations, of course. And also, in many, in many other religions, example in Islam, it also teaches you not to worship idols. You see? But only in the Bible, you find that you have to keep the seventh day Sabbath as a holy day to remember the Lord, your Creator. The one who created the heavens and the earth and everything that is inside. This is his signature of love. This is his stamp. This is his seal. So, point number one. The Sabbath is God's seal. Okay? I also want to quote from Patriarchs and Prophet 307.2. Patriarchs and Prophet 307.2. The fourth commandment is the only one of all the ten in which are found both the name and the title of the lawgiver. It is the only one that shows by whose authority the law is given. Thus, it contains the seal of God. Affixed to his law as evidence of its authenticity and binding force. Okay? The Sabbath contains the seal of God. Alright? That is my first point. The Sabbath is the seal of God. Now, before I move forward, I want to give you another interesting point on the Sabbath. Alright? Do you know that the Sabbath is also a test of loyalty for us today? The Sabbath day, the seventh day Sabbath, is a test of loyalty for us today. In the beginning, God will always have a test of loyalty because God wants free worship. He wants free will worship. Can you worship freely if everything you do is allowed? Can you worship freely? You cannot, because whatever you do is allowed. That means how, how to show that you don't like God. There must be a way to show that you don't like God. So God has to put a test in place. For Adam and Eve, it was the what? Was the Sabbath a test for Adam and Eve? No, it was the? Yes. Do not eat from the fruit of the tree. Correct, right, not? Don't eat. Now, Many people out there, Christians, non-Christians, atheists, other religions, so many people ask this question. If God is so loving, why did he put the tree there? The tree is so poisonous. If you eat from the tree, you die. Then for what God put the tree there? And then they say, you know, if I have children in my house, and because I have children in the house, there are certain objects I don't put in the house. I don't go and put a glass at the corner of the table. I, I don't go and put a football in the middle of the floor and then let the children play and kick, kick the ball everywhere in the house. If I serve food, uh, I won't serve plate of food, plate of food, plate of food, suddenly so plate of poison. And then I say, don't eat this poison. I won't do that. So why did God put a poisonous tree in the middle of the garden and then purposely tempting them to eat it? So let me clarify this today. This one has been mentioned by Ellen White in Education, page 25. It has also been mentioned in Pichats and Prophet. The tree itself is harmless. Did you all know that? The tree and the fruit itself is harmless. If you eat it, nothing will happen to you. Satan was actually telling the truth. That this fruit is actually harmless. You see? What is harmful? Disobedience to God is very harmful. It is wrong to eat the fruit because God said don't eat the fruit. God, no, there's nothing wrong with the fruit. He didn't put a poisonous fruit. He just gave a command. He could have given any command, you know. He could have said, uh, okay, you can eat anything you want, but here's the rule. You cannot look at the sky. Can you imagine that rule? So when you walk, you always have to walk. Like that. One day you wake up, you stretch, oh, I saw the sky. Mistake. You see? It could have been tougher. Oh, God, oh, God could have said something else. God could have said, okay, this is the world I created. You can do anything you want. But you cannot use your right finger and touch your right toe. If you do that, you will surely die. Okay, you understand? It could have been any rule. You know when we play a game, uh, we play poison ball. So we take the ball and we roll the ball. Whoever, I play with my students in school. Whoever uh, the ball gets the leg up, they, they lose. They, they so-called they die. Okay? Is the ball poisonous? 
Is it that the ball hit them so the ball is poisonous? I'm a bad teacher because I put a poisonous ball there. No, it's not. It's just the rules of the game. If the ball hit your leg, then you die. You see, there's nothing wrong with the ball. The, the thing is my command. I can change the ball to a water bottle or so. You see, God doesn't need that three day. It, it could be anything. It could have said, don't go and swim in that side of the river. Don't go fishing in this place. It could have been anything. It is disobeying the command that causes death. Adam and Eve, after they ate the fruit, the Bible record that their eyes were open. Right? They know both good. So we visualize, uh, oh, they pluck the fruit. Then they come, they, they eat the fruit. <gasps> after they eat, they, oh, now, now they realize all good and evil, you see? And it's because of the fruit. It's not because of the fruit. It's because, you see, all this while they know good. What is good? Good is obedience to God. But after they eat it, now they also know evil, which is disobedience to God. All through the Bible, uh, God has a very big problem. Disobedience. God has a big problem with disobedience. Even in heaven, uh, Lucifer disobeyed God. A problem of disobedience was there. It was rampant. God does not have a problem with fruit eating. Fruit eating is not mentioned in any of the Ten Commandments. Okay? The commandments talk about disobedience, not fruit eating. The fruit itself was harmless. Now, test of loyalty. Can you imagine? Let's say Adam and Eve did not eat the fruit. Let's say time continues on uh, and there's development of science and technology as we know today. What do you think will happen? Can they touch the fruit? Is it allowed to touch the fruit? Then yes, they can touch. The rule is you can't eat it. Can they take the fruit and play football with each other? Can it? It's not, it's not wrong. Okay? Can they cut the fruit? Can they invent a microscope and analyze the fruit? Can they do tests on the fruits? Scientific experiments on the fruit? Nutritional experiments on the fruit? Can. What will they find? They will find out that there is no poison in the fruit. They will find out that the fruit is harmless. What will they think? God said if we eat the fruit, we will die. But now with science and technology, I have proven that this fruit is harmless. That means what God is saying is wrong. Lah. I have proven it with science and technology that if I eat the fruit, I won't die. And I found out that some qualities there and nutrients there is good for my health. I uh, went like that. Huh? I think last time my great 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 grandfather Adam I didn't know. Lah. That's why science and technology has developed. They will find that the fruit is harmless. God won't create a poisonous tree and put it in the center for you, okay? Is it easy or harder to keep the rule now? It becomes harder again okay? because, because you start thinking, for what? For what? This fruit is clearly proven to be correct. And then of course you will have some researchers that say, no, 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 the fruit is the fruit is very, very bad for health. I am a Christian, we believe in the Bible, I know that this fruit is bad for health. Then another group say, I am an atheist, I don't believe in all this. I believe in science, it has proven the fruit is fine, you don't tell lies. You see? And that war will be arguing on and on and on. The more you develop in science, and the more illogical not eating the fruit will seem. That is the test of loyalty. It is not the test of science, the book of knowledge, it's not about that. It is the test of loyalty. Loyalty is done by following simple things. I said no. Can you follow or cannot? As simple as that. You see? Sabbath today is a test of loyalty for us. We don't have a fruit that we cannot eat. Okay? Whatever fruit you see, you can definitely eat it. Alright? Then uh, make sure it's a fruit and make sure you can eat it. Okay? There are some fruits you cannot eat. Okay. Sabbath uh, is another law in the Ten Commandments that does not make sense. It's not logical. Do you know like do not murder and do not steal? Even without God, uh, you will arrive to the same conclusion. Many people who don't worship God also don't steal. They don't go and kill people or commit adultery all the time. They, they don't do these things. It is a moral law. People can come to the conclusion themselves. If you can do whatever you want. Can you imagine if everyone is allowed to murder, would you like to live in this world? No, it's very scary. So when, when you're young like me, okay, you, know, you can wear this tri tribal costume and go out and murder people. But how happened when I'm old and thin and then I got a lot of money in the house. I just every day look at the door and wonder who's going to kill me. Who's going to come and steal my money. 
You see, it is not a good place to live in, right? How about the first three commandments? Don't worship idols, don't worship this. Don't. We can rationalize it with our brains. Because uh, you imagine some God created us and now we are worshipping a false God. How will that make the God feel? It will be very sad, right? If you did something so hard and somebody else is falsely getting all the credit for what you did, you feel down, correct? Huh? Of course we can rationalize, we don't bow down to our idols. That is a very low thing to do. But the fourth commandment, it does not make sense. It is not logical. Yes, we can accept that, oh, six days you rest, then uh, six days you work, then one day you rest. It's like to recharge yourself, you know, refuel, recharge. Ah, that one we can understand. But why must it be the seventh day? Why must it be Saturday? Why can't we rest on Sunday? Why can't I rest on Monday or Tuesday? You know, I think many working people would love to rest on Monday. Okay? Why can't we rest on Monday or any other day? Why must it be Saturday? The more we, we experiment, find out, oh, maybe Saturday, uh, the sun is in a special place and then the, the moon is extra higher, then, then we, got, we have less, uh, we have more gravitational force, so, so it, we are pulled down to the earth a bit more, so if you work, it's harder. Science will never prove this kind of thing, because it is the test of loyalty. The more you study it, the more you will find that it is not logical or irrational to keep the seventh day Sabbath. And the more you realize that, the more you will now believe that this is indeed the test of loyalty from God. So like how Adam and Eve had the tree of knowledge of good and evil as their test, the Sabbath is the test of loyalty for us today, to our Creator. I have covered two points. Number one, the Sabbath is the seal of God. The only commandment that tells you from whom is the commandment. Number two, I have told you that the Sabbath is the test of loyalty for today's people. It is the only commandment that simply doesn't make sense. Also, let me quote from last day events, page 220. Ellen White puts it simply, the Sabbath is the test of our loyalty to God. Right? So, Sabbath is the seal, as I mentioned earlier. So, are you telling me that in Revelation, chapter 7, when we receive the seal of God in our foreheads, the Sabbath day is going to be sticked on our forehead, is it? The Sabbath day is a day, is a time, is a time. How to stick that on the forehead? If you say stick a car on the forehead, at least I can visualize a, a thing sticking on my forehead. But how to stick the Sabbath day on the forehead? If you say it's inside the head, the heart, how to put the Sabbath day in my heart? That means what I am the Sabbath. Yeah, can it be like that? No. The Sabbath is the seal of God. But the Sabbath is not the seal that we receive on our forehead. Alright? So there's a lot of misunderstanding here. Because yes, the Sabbath is the seal of God. But when you talk about the revelation receiving the seal on your forehead, that is not the Sabbath. Receiving the Sabbath is not, is not the seal. Alright? It's not the seal. So, my question, what is the seal that we receive on our foreheads? What is that? How do we receive that seal on our foreheads? The one mentioned in Revelation, uh, chapter 7, verse 3. Saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. So how do we seal the servants of God in their foreheads? You see, another, another group of people say that, Oh, that means uh, you must keep the Ten Commandments, you must follow the rules. Okay? Let me tell you right now, uh, that if you take a very big mahjong paper, uh, not to play mahjong, Take a big margin of paper and write down the rules. All the do's and don'ts. Do uh, send devotions to five people. Don't don't be rude to your elders. Okay, you write you write all the rules. Every morning you wake up, you memorize the rules. Every night before you go to sleep, you tick which one you did, which one you didn't do. And you pray and say, tomorrow this one I must fix this error. And tomorrow morning you start again. Do you think that is the seal of God? Do you think that will get you there? <coughs> of course not, you see. The seal of God uh, is it has to do with the character. God is not on the outward. Man looks at the outside, but God looks on the inside. You see? The character of God in you uh, is the most important thing. Let me tell you that mistake-free living is not Christian living. I give you a very quick analogy because of this picture. This is Moses. He smashed the rock. Correct, right? Is, is that the right thing to do? 
He's not supposed to smash the rock. God never said smash the rock. In his anger, he smashed the rock. Okay? Is that a mistake? Yes, that is a big mistake. You go against God. Did he get punished? Yes. Because of this, huh, he was forbidden to enter the promised land. His whole life was a journey to the promised land. Everybody else went inside except for him. Alright? Let's look at another person. Joseph. Joseph, huh? He went to prison. He went through all these problems. Did he make a mistake? No mistake. It's not his fault. True, no, it's God's plan. It's not his fault, okay? Moses made mistakes, huh? And it's not the only mistake. There are many mistakes that Moses made along the way, okay? He even killed, he's a murderer. He killed one of the Egyptians as well. Because he was short-sighted and didn't know the full plan, okay? He made mistakes. Moses made a lot of mistakes. Joseph didn't make mistakes. So obviously that is recorded in the Bible, okay? Where is Joseph now? Sleeping in the grave, correct? Sleeping in the grave. Where is Moses now? In heaven. Or, or maybe not heaven, but I don't know where is he. He could be touring around or what. I'm not sure how it works there, okay? But Moses is resurrected. Moses, uh, before his earthly death, uh, he, God brought him up to that mountain uh, to see and give vision uh, of all that was going to happen. He saw Jesus Christ, uh, that bronze serpent, lifted up and all eyes that look on him were healed. And he knows what this is talking about because this happened during his generation. He put that bronze serpent there, he put that crown and whoever looks will be healed. And he saw in vision, uh, Oh, the Son of God is going to be crucified on the cross. He saw everything that Jesus did over there. Which you think Moses would have wanted more? To spend the remainder of his uh, donkey years in the promised land with milk and honey or to be there to see that vision? Moses got a better reward, you know. God kept his promise. Yeah, you did this. I'm not putting you in the, in the canon. But God gave him something better also. God can follow the rules and can still reward you. God can punish you for the mistakes that you have made, okay? But God can still make it even better for you through the punishment. Do you know that when Jesus was in Gethsemane, who was there with him? Moses and Elijah, they were there with him. Which you think Moses prefers now? Going to Canaan and having milk and honey and dying after that? And staying dead till the second coming? Or would Moses prefer the second option? But Moses made mistake, you know. But his reward was better. Joseph made a, did not make mistakes, hold on everything. But he did not get exalted to the same position that Moses got exalted to. So my point uh, is not that Moses is better than Joseph, okay? My point is that mistake-free living is not Christian living. Don't wake up in the morning and, oh, I, I made a mistake here. Okay, today I'm going to start my day. But by 8.30, uh, yeah, this person, when I cut me at the road, I cursed him, now finish today, gone today. I'll try again tomorrow. Everything, all hope is lost. It's not like that. Mistake-free living uh, is not Christian living. That is scared living. You're not afraid. I don't know what morning which took place on the use also don't know. On the pump caltex or shell also don't know. You heard that shell they're digging unsustainably. So better not pump shell. But that shell is a good petrol or your how? That is not Christian living. That is definitely not what Jesus Christ is all about. Mistake-free living uh, is not Christian living. What is Christian living? Christian living uh, is receiving a daily baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those who are baptized daily, the Holy Spirit transforms your heart. Galatians 5.22, what is that? Galatians 5.22 The fruits of the Spirit, okay, the fruits of the Spirit. Do you think you can keep a checklist of the fruits of the Spirit or not? Every day I will show love, be faithful, I will have patience, I will have meekness, I will have temperance. Do you think you can follow that? How to have, how to tick off long suffering? Today, uh, somebody told me I didn't say anything, so I tick long suffering. How about tomorrow, uh, when somebody crash your brand new car and kill your loved one together, and then you don't get angry and, and you tick off long suffering? You think you can tick it off? You cannot manufacture or conjure like magic. Ah, here's the fruits of the spirit. Ta da! You know, you cannot. Only the Holy Spirit can do this kind of work in you. So then what is the seal of God? How, how do we have, how can we say that, okay, now I am sealed. What, what to do now to receive the seal? What, what must we do? What does it take? Because definitely the seal people of God uh, will keep all ten commandments. That is for sure. The, the seal people of God will surely be mistake free. But that's not their intention. 
They don't even care whether they're making mistakes or not. It's just naturally they will not make mistakes. But if you try not to make mistakes like that, you haven't reached the point yet. So how to reach that point? Now, when we talk about Revelation chapter 7, 144,000 and the ceiling, the ceiling, all the Bible study teachers will always connect it with Ezekiel chapter 8 and chapter 9 and we can go very deep into it. Today I just want to touch on the surface. In Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4, it tells you of a group of people. God is going to unleash some murderers. They are going to go through the land and slaughter everybody in the land. Alright? But before the slaughter comes, they are going to seal these people in Ezekiel 9 verse 4 on the forehead. And the command from God uh, is to kill everybody except those people who got the seal. So is it good to have the seal or not? It's good. It's good to have the seal of God. Then you will not be killed. And Ezekiel 9 verse 4, they tell you what you need to do to receive the seal. It is stated there. The answer is, seal them those who cry, those who sigh and cry. So you know it's sighing and crying. Sigh is... <sighs> Cry is a, oh, you, why, why, okay, that is sighing and crying. So we should practice sighing and crying every day. We cancel off the Adventist choir group and practice the sighing and crying group. So what is sighing and crying? What are they sighing and crying about? They are sighing and crying about what happened in chapter 8, Ezekiel chapter 8. What happened was, abominations entered the sanctuary. That means in God's system of worship, a false system of worship has entered inside. People of God are now following the false system of worship. Is this good or bad? So, how, how would, as parents, if your children, you taught them how to go for exercise and live a healthy lifestyle. And then they come and tell you that, oh, mom, dad, I found another healthy lifestyle. You see, like, let's say you got not enough sleep, right? you drink coffee. Then after you stay awake. And then you already know, oh, coffee uh, is going to create a lot of heart problem. It's going to add cholesterol. It's going to be bad for your body. And then they come and tell you, oh, mommy, daddy, I learned something new. You know, when you stress, uh, it's not good for your health. Then you're like, yes, yes, that's why I tell you, you must pray when you're stressed. And you say, no, 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 you can also take secrets, it will reduce your stress. How do you feel? You feel, oh, good luck, my children, finally now they won't have stress. No, you know that, oh, you're smoking secret, or maybe one day he will cut his leg out, maybe he's going to get a heart attack, then you see them drinking late at night. Oh, they say this is entertainment, this is the life. <coughs> when they are small, they teach them about the abundant life that Jesus Christ gave. When they are 21 years old, they take their, alcohol, their, their, their beer and tell you this is the life. You see, you feel very sad. You sigh and you cry. That is the meaning of sighing and crying. When, when you have done all you can for this person, uh, and they refuse to follow what you are saying. It is not... Uh, we sit down in the church and then say, Oh, yo, that church pastor, uh, he preached uh, something wrong with his preaching one. Actually, he's talking political things one. Huh? Yo, this, this head elder, uh, he, every time in the meeting, he will bring out his own agenda. He actually is trying to talk the other person over there, you know. Yeah, la, I don't know how these people all enter the church. This is not sighing and crying. Uh. This is gossiping and murmuring. The Israelites were killed because of this. God will wipe out these kind of people, you see. This is the murmuring and gossiping. This is not correct. That is not sighing and crying. I want to give you one example of the correct way to sigh and cry. Who cried in the Bible? Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Okay. When did he cry? Say again. <coughs> the, the temple. Another one? Mount of Olives. No, no. Another one. Another one. when he was riding on the donkey to go into Jerusalem. Jesus uh, was riding on the donkey going to Jerusalem. The whole of Jerusalem, uh, they, wore, they really polished their shoes, they looked very handsome. They, this is their Messiah coming. They are very proud of their land. You know, if a visitor is coming to your house, you wash your house, you wear the best clothes, and, oh, you want to welcome the visitor, you say, this is the house. And then, uh, Imagine the visitor is the one that bought for you the house. A long time ago, they paid for it. Today, the old people, they come here, they want to see how the house looks like. Did you take care of it or not? So, wow, you took care of it very well. You're smiling there like that. And they come to your doorstep and you see they're crying. How you feel? 
they look at the house and they cry. You see, it, 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 it's a very emotional time over there. Why was Jesus crying? And now, now that I told you, by the way, the sun was shining on Jerusalem, and it's the golden city. It looks very beautiful. But the savior of the donkey I was crying, you know. Of course, you understand why he was crying, right? How do you imagine how he was crying? How was he crying? I always imagine uh, that he was on the donkey, and then after that, uh, riding, and then there was one teardrop falling down. Just one. Just one teardrop falling down, and... Okay? And then I found out from my cyber school class and my CG that some people imagine uh, that he, he didn't actually cry out loud, but in his heart, like he was very sad, like, like a cry just inside it. Just, just like that, I mean. Okay? How do you all imagine he cried? But he did say, yes? How long I have tried to give you under Ah, he said all these things, so he actually voiced it out, but how he, so he just voiced out how he cried. I think while Balaji was hopping, uh, <laughs> was hopping, he goes, how long? Okay, so there are many different things, okay, but actually, Mrs. White told us exactly how he cries. Let me read to you the paragraph, okay? Desire of Ages, page 575. His eyes filled with tears. His eyes were filled with tears. His body rocked to and fro like a tree before the tempest. You know the tree, huh? and then the storm blows, you know, the storm is blowing, huh? the tree nearly collapses, and it go back that side, go back this side. That kind of like, rocking, you know, so he's on the donkey crying, so how are the eyes full of tears, and he's like, oh, why? Why like that? Oh, yo, why? Do you, you see the whole body up, down, up, down, the whole body, people from far can see moving like that today, you see? while a wail of anguish burst from his quivering lips. So he's actually shouting also, you know. As if from the depths of a broken heart. His heart was broken already, you see. Tears and groans of insuppressible agony, you know. If I pinch you one time very hard, huh, you surely feel pain, right? But how will you shout? Ow! But if I really take a spear and spear you, especially in a wound, you will ah, like that. Jesus uh, gave groans of insuppressible agony, you know. He was shaking, his body was moving like a tree in a storm, you know. He was really crying and wailing. I teach in a school, so I have got 12 year old kids. And when you don't give them what they want, uh, and they throw a tantrum, I know I can imagine it. Okay, he really scream and everything. Why? It was the sight of Jerusalem that had pierced the heart of Jesus. Jerusalem that had rejected the Son of God and scorned His love. They don't want to accept His love. That refused to be convinced by His mighty miracles. Jesus huh, did miracles in His lifetime to convince Jerusalem that He is the Son of God, that the Kingdom of God is at hand. He didn't have to do a single miracle by right because uh, the testament already tell about his coming and they should be ready for it. They should, the Jews, other people need the miracles, but Jerusalem uh, should not take even one miracle because they should know straight away. They have been memorizing the Torah all this while, but they refused to be convinced by his mighty miracles and was about to take his life on top of it. Uh, they want to kill him. He saw what she was in her guilt of rejecting her redeemer and what she might have been had she accepted him who alone could heal her wound. He had come to save her, how could he give her up? You know, you will sigh and cry eh, when, when you are in Jesus' position. When you have done everything you can eh, to bring somebody else to Jesus Christ and that person don't want to accept. You know that pain that you feel, that is how Jesus Christ felt. You have done all you can. You have given whatever money can be given. You have done whatever Bible study you can do. You have called whoever can be called. You brought whoever can be brought. Everything you have done. You have spent your whole life with that person. Your life is just going to die a day. Your life is coming to an end. But that person still does not want to accept. What can you do now? You see? But the worst thing you can do is hate the person. That's the worst thing you can do. The worst thing you can do. Okay, I don't talk to you anymore, really. 
Because sometimes I told you, people do not just like, ah, oh, okay lah, that's your religion, this my my belief is different. That one is a nice rejection, you see. Sometimes they say, you are talking nonsense lah, you believe in the fairy tale God lah, you, you, you give me evidence that God God. You know, and they answer you like that, they, they sound so arrogant and all that. And then they compare it to your life. Yeah lah, Richard, you keep talking about this God, so-called God. That's why you are just a teacher in lighthouse only, nothing special, you see. Can you imagine if you get this kind of answer? They hurt your career, you know, you, you're so passionate about your, your career and now they come and attack your career, nothing to do with the, with the Bible also. Can you still love those people? Do you still have a heart huh, to come back next week for the next Bible study? Or to maybe next week is the birthday, you still have the heart to go and find a cake that they like, the best flavour they like, and you eat them? Or you feel, oh, I don't want to talk to this person today. You see? Jerusalem was going to crucify Jesus, you know. And he cried that badly because they still don't want to accept him. They don't know what to do already. But he is not stopping, is it? The last one is how could he give her up? This is what it means uh, to have the fruits of the Spirit. This is what it means to have the character of Jesus Christ. Do you think keeping a list of rules, uh, do you think this uh, mistake free living uh, can lead you to this point uh, where you sigh and cry for a lost soul? It's not easy, it's more than that. But when you are at this point, uh, surely you are keeping all the rules away. Surely you are mistake-free living. Correct? Uh? This is the goal. The point of no return. This, how do we get to this point? How do we receive the seal? That is the question from the beginning and until now. To now I want to conclude by telling you in simple words how, what it means to be sealed. What it means to sigh and cry. You see, what is the worst sin you can do? The worst. Say again. Reject God. Okay. How? By what? Disobeying Him. So if God, God tells me, uh, Richard, tonight you sleep early. Sleep by 10 o'clock you sleep. But then at, at 10 o'clock, uh, I, I sin. What I did, uh, I found out that a new series has appeared on Netflix. And then I get on Netflix and watch at 10 o'clock and sleep at 10.30. It means I'm a sinner, I've done a bad sin today, is it? Yes, it's a sin. Disobeying God is a sin. But is it the worst thing to do? No. If I murder somebody tomorrow because I'm so angry, can I still be safe? Or no more chance today? Still no chance, okay. So what is it if I do, uh, I cannot be safe anymore? That means the blood of Jesus Christ uh, cannot help me anymore already. What sin is that? It's mentioned in the Bible. Grieving the Holy Spirit. If you grieve the Holy Spirit, uh, your salvation is lost. No more chance. So how do you grieve the Holy Spirit? What is this? How to do that? It's so bad, you know, everyone is thinking, whatever I do, I'll make sure I don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit doesn't happen one time. It is a process. Grieving the Holy Spirit means you in your mind saying that never again I want to have anything to do with God anymore. I don't want to hear the Holy Spirit anymore. I hate Jesus Christ and I don't care about Him anymore today. I don't want to have anything to do with this religion anymore. That is called grieving the Holy Spirit. Not saying the words. Many, many youth, uh, I'm sure, especially when they break up with their girlfriend, uh, they have said these words before. Ah, oh God, you are terrible God, I don't want to talk to you anymore today. But then probably in 10 minutes, oh God, actually, I'm sorry, like, I said it out of anger. That is not grieving the Holy Spirit, okay? That is sin, of course, you're... you're, you're not acknowledging God, is it? That is bad. But that's not grieving the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit uh, is the Holy Spirit comes to you, prompts you, prompts you, prompts you, and you reject, 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 reject. Maybe after 10 years, uh, you have made up your mind that you don't want to have anything to do with God anymore. That, you have grieved the Holy Spirit. So no human being uh, can say, oh, this person grieved the Holy Spirit today. You won't know. Even you yourself won't know whether you have already grieved the Holy Spirit. Sometimes uh, it can appear that this guy, the Holy Spirit, is gone today because he rejected God and don't want to come to church for 10 years. But after 10 years, uh, he come back to church. That means, in the first place, he never gave the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit was still working on him. God will never give up. Who makes the decision to make the Holy Spirit go away? Is it God? No, it's you. You decide. It is the power is in your hands. You decide. I don't like God. I don't want anything to do with God. That's how you grieve the Holy Spirit. But this is a decision that is made in your mind. You see? 
you won't know whether or not you made this decision. You may think you don't like God now, but things can change. Maybe in 10 years down the road, God will send somebody in your life, God will send a situation in your life, and God will speak to you and you will come back to the path. You see? For those of you watching the video today, God may be speaking to you today to come back to Him. You see? God will always try to reach up to you. Hear His voice. Hear His voice. He is surely speaking to you. Grieving the Holy Spirit is the worst thing to do. Now, the opposite end of the spectrum is what it takes to receive the seal of God. So the opposite of grieving the Holy Spirit. That means, deciding in your mind never again to disobey God. That means you have decided in your mind uh, that whatever happens, whatever temptations, whatever struggles come in my direction, I will always follow what God has to say. I will do everything that will glorify God. Never again will I want to disobey God. That's, that is what it takes to be sealed. Now, the very clever theology studying Adventists have come up with a term for this. They call it the point of no return. You see, when you think of committing suicide, huh? when you think of committing suicide, and you decide you're going to jump off the cliff, can you change your mind now or not in the house? Okay? Now you're driving there. I want to know, I don't like to drive. Can you change your mind and go back? Okay, you can still change. You park your car a day. And now, you are hiking up. Can you change your mind? Now you reach the cliff. You are standing here looking down. Can you change your mind now or not? Yes. Then I can say, hey, yeah, what is wrong idea? And then you go back. You can. You can stop yourself. If you are watching this, and you are thinking of committing suicide, it is not too late now. You can still change your mind. But, after you jump, can you change your mind or not? You cannot believe. That is the point of no return. So in the last days, uh, in Revelation 7 verse 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Sealing of the servants of God in their foreheads means that these servants of God, the 144,000, have decided in their heads never to sin against God. Never to do anything that will break hearts, that break the heart of God. They have decided that whatever temptation you put in, in front of me, uh, I will not fall for it. I will always choose to honor God. Example in the Bible, Job. Remember Job? God said, test my servant Job. Job, in his mind, has decided uh, never to go against God anymore. Whatever happens, he will only think good things about God. Do you think Satan will believe you when you say that? Huh? Even I won't believe you when you say that, you know? If you come to me and say, huh, Richard, you know, after I heard you preach your sermon, I've decided I will be, I will always follow what God says. Even I won't believe you. Don't talk about me. If I tell you, okay, everyone in Pulim, I have decided whatever God says, I will follow. Anyone believe me or not? You think, so 10 years from now, you think I'll make a mistake or not? I think even on the way back, I might make a mistake already. You see, I might, I might already do something that doesn't glorify God, right? Satan, uh, even if God says something, Satan won't believe. So when you say, uh, I will glorify God always with my action, Satan will test you. Satan will not believe what you say. The angels believe God. God said, Job, my servant, is blameless. He will not sin against me. Satan will say, Lord, I don't believe. Let me test. Of course, he, of course he believes you because you bless him. You take his blessing, he will curse you. A man values his life more than other things. Ah, God said, go and test him. Don't touch his life. Satan went, oh, he destroyed every blessing, put balls on his skin, sent his four good friends to tell him, because of his mistake, all these things are happening. Did Job fall? Did Job ever say that, I, I curse my God, I don't like God anymore? Never. He remained faithful. So it will be in the end of times. These 144,000 people uh, who are living when Jesus Christ comes back, these people will be thoroughly tested by Satan. They will be attacked left, right and center. They will be tricked. They will be cheated. They will be tempted. Everything will be done to them. They will stand firm. Because they have decided in their heart and in their mind that they 
are at the point of no return. They will never turn back to the world. They have decided to leave the world and follow Jesus Christ. They will never turn back. They have jumped already. That's why the Bible says that at the end of time, at the close of probation, let the righteous be righteous still and the unrighteous be unrighteous still. Because both sides have come to a point of no return. Now we are still on the cliff. Anytime we can go back and come back, you see. But at that time, they, everyone would have jumped. They would have jumped to decide never to follow God again and grieve the Holy Spirit. Or they would have jumped and said, whatever happens, we will always follow God. Even if I die, I will still follow God. You see? The point of no return. That is receiving the seal of God. That is the seal of God that is going to be sealed on the servant's foreheads. The decision to always follow God. Let me give you a quote. Last day events, page 219. The seal is settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. The seal, uh, this is the seal that you receive on the forehead, 144,000. The seal is a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved. Cannot move them out of their position anymore. Nothing can be done to move this 144,000 out of their position. What position? The position that I will worship Jesus Christ no matter what. How many of us would like to be in that position? How many of us want to be in that position that whatever happens, whatever time I lose my job, I lose my wife, I lose my house, I lose my life, I still worship Jesus Christ no matter what. You cannot be moved. Stand with me so I can pray with you. Anyone who wants to be in this position, Stand with me and I'll pray with you. Every head bow, every eye closed. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for holding the four winds, for waiting until all of us can be ready to be in that point of no return. We thank you, Lord, for being patient with us. You could have come back many years ago, but you decided to wait for me, for the audience, and for whoever is listening. There are still some people who have not made up their mind, who have not come to the point of no return. We thank you so much, Father, for waiting for us, so that we will not be lost with the world, so that we can enjoy our time together in heaven one day. Lord, as we go through the journey, we want to remember and we want to Recognize your signature of love on the fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath, as your seal. It is your test of loyalty, and may you find us faithful in that test, Lord. And God, we thank you for letting us know that the 144,000 are a special group of people who have come to the point of no return. They have turned away from the world, and they will never again join the world. God, we want to be a part of that group. We want to be counted with that group if we are not in that group. We want to be counted with that group. So Lord, please send your Holy Spirit, rain it down upon us because the convicting power of the heart is not something we can do by ourselves, but only you can do that work in us. You have said through inspiration that even the desire to follow Jesus comes from the Holy Spirit. So God, we trust that everything is the most securest in your hands. Thank you, Father, for looking after each and every one of us. Thank you for foreseeing the futures that we cannot see. Thank you for preventing the disasters that we could not have seen or prevented. God, we thank you and we pray all these things in the name of your loving Son, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you.